It's kind of a windy day, so I'm debating on this. My first time to do this. First members of the wagon train that I'm looking at 20 years later. It's the Sorensons. We're going to check on Steve and Wendy and maybe their family. So, uh, hey, this is the first for me. I was always behind the camera this time, a little bit in front of the camera. My hair's gone wacko. Hey, we're going to do this. Come to the Sorensons. Sorensen's with an E. That's who they're right there. Hey, stranger. Hey, hey old friend. How's it going? Good. It's going really okay. Well. It's a Sorensen's 20 years later. Yes, Come on inside. We look like it. <laughs> Has it really been 20 years? Yeah. It seems like it was yesterday, and then it seems like it was a century ago. So yeah, it's been 20 years. My kids, what's, what's cool is that we just talked to Mike Dunn today and he and Lindsay have kids exactly the same age as our kids on the wagon train. And so it's come full circle. Steve and I were 38 on the wagon train. Wendy Westergaard is our age um, and has kids. Her oldest is a 15-year-old, just like ours turned 15 out yeah, there. Just like Brody Pack and the other, the other folks that... Uh, yeah, Brody's in Oregon. Yeah, Brody... Uh, Brody is 38. He was, he's the same age now as I was when we were out there. And uh, yeah, and 20 ben, years ago, do the math. And our oldest is going to be 35 this summer. So he's only three years younger than we were. Yeah, he turned 15 when we were out there yeah. in July, July 16th. And so he is going to be 35 this summer. He's only three years younger than we were when we were on the wagon train. So what you're saying is there's a second generation. <laughs> yeah, it's a circle of time is what's at going least. on. At least, yeah, at least. Awesome. No, they're, they're coming along. And uh, we'll go back in a month for uh, the law school graduation of our second son, Pete, who was um, a troublemaker out there. <laughs> he wasn't that big of a And I don't know if anybody's more surprised than he is that he's graduating law school in a month or so. Which law school? In Oklahoma, Oklahoma awesome. City University. Yep, it's uh, it's great stuff. So life moves on, but uh, I think in our family, it's also stayed pretty firmly rooted in that kind of epic adventure of 97. We came home and uh, I guess we weren't done having children because we had another in 1999. And uh, People ask us if it happened out there and I just laugh at them. Yeah, right, we had 15 people in our tent, <laughs> no way. She was a surprise afterwards. We were walking that day, and Steve knew I'd been praying about it and, and just thought, you know, what about, what about those babies? Will I get a chance to raise them? Because I felt like I wasn't done. And uh, while we were walking, Steve and I felt a little, a little kid, like a three or four year old, sort of in my dress. And of course, we had, I had all those authentic clothes on and with thick, thick petticoats and everything. And there were kids around us. And so I kept looking down, and I said to Steve, you see that kid? And he said, yeah. It was little, we just sort of got a glimpse of a little sandy haired wild boy, we thought, little boy, and thought it was just sort of this reassurance. And I had this profound feeling that I knew I was gonna, I wasn't done being a mom. And I knew that we weren't going to be having any more kids in this life. So I thought, well, at least during the millennium or sometime, maybe I'd get to raise these kids. And, or maybe that's the kid. And lo and behold, we got home and a, Oh, we got a dog, which we promised the kids we'd get a dog if soon as I was done having children. And right after we got the dog, <laughs> I found out I was pregnant, and it was it was impossible. I mean, it, we beat all sorts of odds, and and I thought, okay, I'm done. When I lose this baby, we're done. I'm not going to do this anymore. This is just horrible. And we didn't we didn't lose her. And we went in for our ultrasound, and we were expecting this little boy. We named him after our two dads, William Bruce. We knew who he was going to be. And lo and behold, she was a little girl. And so we named her Margaret Johanna after our two grandmothers. My grandmother was Margaret um, Ann Romney Stewart Hewlett, who was named after her grandmother, Margaret Ann Thomas Romney. Grandma was born 100 years to the year before Maggie was born. And she was blessed in her blessing outfit. And it was, it was a full circle. And she came at a time when Ben was struggling and, frankly, knew when she was supposed to come and has been a gift to us ever since, right? <laughs>
Look yeah. at Steve. <laughs> Great gift. <laughs> she's a senior in high school. And no, she, she, is... she sort of has the world by the tail. The nice thing is, is that she's been raised by six parents, not just us, but her four siblings, who uh, keep her on track. Do you ever long for the trail? No. Um, it's an interesting question because... I, I think back about it a lot. I reminisce about it. The nice thing is, much like childbirth, I think that time and distance have made it a sweet experience. But going through it, uh, there were many times where it was tough and it was difficult and it was uh, emotionally taxing. So uh, much like if you ask somebody my age, hey, would you like to go back through high school? Uh, no, high school was fine, and it was great, and we made it through it. But uh, I don't want to go through the wagon train again for different reasons. I would not trade my experience for anything in the world. I mean, literally, I would not trade it. But I never have to do it again. Most incredible thing that I've ever gone through, experienced, changed me as a human being, but I don't need to do it again. And unlike childbirth, I would do childbirth again. But I don't. It's, it's more profound than that to me. It's... Uh, it was life altering. Have you guys become the track experts in your state? Uh, Is that right? <laughs> Has that happened to you too? Yeah, uh -huh. that's happened Has to everybody. us. Everybody. No, it took me about uh, at least a dozen years, um, maybe even fifteen years after the wagon train, to to be able to deal with everything that that happened and went on out there. Uh, I wrote a book about it. Um, and uh, bled 260 pages of text out about what happened and what it was uh, of a, an experience that was deeply personal to us. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And as a family, doing it yeah, together. But you know, mm -hmm. greatest highs. Sure. One of the most deeply spiritual experiences. And some of those spiritual experiences like in life settle on you afterwards and you go, whoa, that's incredible. But we were so in the moment that there were times that we had no idea. We could not, we felt the Lord's support and hand, but did not actually see it until we stepped back and thought, whoa, the finger of God. It was amazing. Hundreds and thousands of people were out there, each having their own individual experience. And each one going through the exact same things, it seemed, but each one feeling differently, uh, expressing differently, and understanding differently what they were going through almost 200 in the first two years. I think we counted, there were 200. Yeah, we, Fireside, sacrament meetings, uh, book groups, you name it, whatever, we did a lot. And they didn't stop. I think that last year we had one or two, and we haven't had one this year yet. It's We're getting into trek season and we haven't been called, but people don't even know, they weren't alive. These kids were not alive when we went on it. So. They look at us like, here, look at this grandma and grandpa, and they're going to tell you what you're supposed to fill out on the trail. But the coolest thing about that whole thing is, is that Maggie, our little Margaret Johanna, um, went on treks with us from the time she was three or four. So she would go and she would speak or she would sing. The girls sang the song until they were too old to sing, and then she started singing even though she wasn't even out there. But she tells everyone she was out there because she truly at two or three would talk about when I was on the wagon train. And we don't know if it was because she just felt it with our family or because she actually remembered being out there. But um, she told everybody in the family, you know, I'm not going on a mission. I don't need a trek. I don't need any of this stuff. And, you know, her four siblings had all gone on missions. And and it was very interesting because she, you know, she'd gone on, what, f four or five treks by the time our, mm -hmm. even one in our state, they let her go because she was 14 because we were going to be out there. And so, of course, she could go earlier. She was 13. She was too young to go. And So then it was her turn to go last year as a 17-year-old. And... Uh, we weren't there. We weren't even invited to speak or be part of it. We were sort of, this is our state. Come on, you know. They, how come they never, they, they just don't use us very often. You know, other stakes keep calling us and want us. And, and uh, she had an experience. Changed her life. She, she doesn't talk a lot about it. Um, it's one of those very sacred experiences to her. But she came home and she said, Mom, 472 days till I can put my papers in on my mission. I said, great, <laughs> what happened? She said, 
I know I need to go on a mission. She had an experience. Hello. Oh my Dream goodness. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? This is Libby. She's been volunteering all day at the Tracy Aviary. Yep. Hello. <clears throat> she graduated from BYU in wildlife and wildlands conservation. Libby was seven. Yes. Crossing the plane. She was our youngest. Mm -hmm. And she if you had turned eight, we would have baptized you. Well, she, we did baptize her in. I the was Colorado baptized river. in a river uh, On March the 30th. next March, that next March, and we I wanted to be ice. baptized like the pioneers. So we broke the ice. She yeah. she literally we literally broke the ice, made a dam, had her in a pioneer white dress, and baptized her in water this deep, and then ran her into a cabin and put her yeah, in a nice warm tub. But she wanted. In. She wanted to be baptized like the pioneers. I'm just dramatic, probably. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but she you know what? Go. She is no. She it couldn't. was really neat. It definitely was an interesting experience. And when I went and served a mission in Brazil, I talked to people about how I was baptized like the pioneers, and they love to hear stories about the pioneers because they, they're lots of them are pioneers, and we talk about the importance of pioneers and. Um, heritage and they just think that the Mormon pioneers are an incredible story and it's kind of a cool connection. Tell them about that wagon train that happened in 1997 and how I was that a little ragamuffin seven-year-old on that wagon train. We had attempted to try to create enough of an authentic experience in in the camp and in the way that we approached it with our food, with our clothing and everything else Sleeping and in the way that we would behave that we wanted to try to not just for ourselves, but for the public at large, portray pioneer life. And uh, we like didn't what sleep he said, in pajamas. I mean, we didn't change our clothes when we went in the tent. We were pioneers all the way the whole time. Yeah, like Wendy said, it, it kind of started with the first day. The funny thing is too is that as we as we went along, and whether it was hauling a handcart or luckily maybe riding on a wagon or something during the day, uh, when we when we made it to the end of the trail in a particular day, uh, that's kind of uh, when our work began because then we would set up our tents, break our camp open, and begin to uh, prepare dinner and everything it else. Took hours because while, we were doing it with fire. While the public massed around us. And we even had to change our strategy and almost sort of make our camp a little fort like so that we could keep people out because they wanted uh, to eat it or buy it or they were in our tents <laughs> and they were under our blankets and they were all through we're everything. Museum, right? Yeah. We were just sort of props in, in the experience that they were having. And uh, I mean it was just sort of funny because uh, People would stalk us as well. We had, over the course of these early days in Nebraska, we had uh, we had a couple that came, came uh, four days in a row, and finally they were probably about 70, 80 miles from their home, but they'd been coming every day to, to visit these kids. kids. And just, you know, they gave we... Gifts. Yeah, they gave us gifts. They were our Nebraskan grandparents. <laughs> I remember them. They, they, they gave, they gave, they gave the boys shot glasses gifts. from Nebraska. Yeah, they gave, us all, they gave us little jewelry boxes, and they gave my brother shot glasses. Something that I thought, thinking about that question, I was thinking about watching the process of having a new group of people come out and watching them become part of it every single week. Because we were part of it from start to finish, but we had kind of a unique experience because all of the authentic camp, there were docents that came out every single week. So watching them at the beginning of the week and what they Clean kind of, what they cared about at the beginning of the week and then watching them become part of the trail and then by the end of the week, they were just like us, right? And they didn't want to go home. But it was interesting because we kind of just laughed at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week we cried, right? Because <laughs> yeah, exactly you watched that process every single week of somebody really understand what it was all about. And you would see them hit their own wall because oh. they would come out with all the bravado and enthusiasm and creases in their clothing and everything else. And uh, boy, by about Tuesday or Wednesday, they were broken. and. They had blisters, they had blisters had say, and they were in pain. Where's the spiritual experience? I, I just, I know that you talk to us about it being a spirit. I just don't see what's spiritual about this. This is so hard. And I, you know, my kids are not eating and I mean, they're just losing. And I'm just, I just have to go, it will come, it will come. And then at the end, you know, they're begging to come back another week. And, and what can we do? How can we stay longer? So you talk about reenacting, you have to, it's just, you have to act. There's no reenact. It's, I was actually, we were living it. And by living it, we learned those lessons. And frankly, a lot of other spiritual and physical and mental lessons the same way because of the same experience.
And yes, we could call ambulances, but you know what? The, the mission was the same. It was to get our kids through, to get our family through, to get them fed, to get them sheltered, and we were doing it a lot of the same way that they did it. First time I didn't, the only day on the entire wagon train that I did not wear uh, Pioneer clothing was, was a day that I, the first day that I'd been out where um, I knew I wasn't pregnant. And it was after my miscarriage. And it was quite an emotional experience because I went through every dress, every un petticoat, every underpinning I had. And I went to a laundromat, which I'd never done because we washed everything over the, over the fire and in our wash tubs and, and cried the whole time thinking about my great grandparents, these wonderful women, these wonderful pioneer women that buried children along the way and had to keep going. And they kept going. Whether they had what they needed or they didn't, they kept going and they made it. Some of them didn't. Some of them were buried along the way, but that was a profound experience for me that I couldn't have had any other way.